Today we're going to talk about issues with embedded device disclosure, uh, specifically focusing on helping vendors and recognizing kind of a new class of end user. Um, I just recently took a new job, actually just before I boarded the plane on my way to, to Amsterdam here, uh, with a company called Mokana. Uh, previously I did a lot of device research uh, on my own time, separate from, from my, my daytime job at work. Um, as of this conference, I'm going to be doing that as a full-time job. Uh, Mokana is a company that was founded uh, in 2004 by some people from RSA, and they kind of specialize on securing uh, the, the security of devices. So think anything that's not uh, a PC or a server. So all these new embedded devices, all of these things that are becoming connected uh, and uh, trying to get more security focus on that. So developing products, developing consulting, kind of looking at those products and helping the industry with that. Um, we're to, we recently started something called the Smart Device Threat Center, which is going to take a look at all of those kind of categories of devices in each of those verticals and kind of talk about what those threats are, new vulnerabilities that are coming out, and helping the vendors with those vulnerabilities. So recently, we've seen a kind of an increase in talks at conferences on these smart devices, um, and specifically kind of the question of offense versus defense. Um, our keynote speaker mentioned it, kind of the, this, this, uh, this tension between offensive and defensive um, kind of discourse, right? We've had years of this discourse talking about, oh, defense is so hard, you know, because on a defensive side, you have to protect against every threat at all times from, from every direction. Um, oh, that was very nice. The computer just turned off. Hold on one second here. Make sure I don't electrocute myself. Yeah, the plug just power plug just popped out and the computer turned off. Hmm? Yeah. It didn't quite doesn't quite get in all there. Okay. Give me one second here to reboot this thing. We should be fine now. I kind of jammed it in there. It's this one right here. So while this is loading, we can talk about where I was at, which is kind of the struggle between offense and defense, right? So defensively, we have to protect against every threat at all times for every possible threat vector, um, and often with uh, less and less funding. Offensively, right, you only have to find one small flaw, one tiny area that you can get in, and you're in. You don't have to be concerned with the rest of the area, so you can focus on one small thing. Um, and uh, as our keynote speaker kind of mentioned, talked about extensively, you know, uh, it's cooler to do offensive things. Uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of these talks are about uh, how, we, how we can break into things, how we can, uh, you know, how we can see the, these vulnerabilities and, you know, how these, how these devices break. Um, specifically, I saw a talk at ShmooCon a couple weeks ago uh, in DC where they had an entire talk which got very heated 
uh, the talk was around sexy defense, right? And about how we should focus more on the defensive aspect of security at these conferences. Um, and that defense can be, you know, an attractive position to take, and it can be an exciting position to take. And there was quite a heated, you know, conversation re regarding that, because we kind of feel like, you know, we've been talking about the same thing for years and years and years, uh, you know, coming out with these new vulnerabilities, coming out with, with new ways of, uh, of breaking devices, and we really haven't been making a ton of progress. We keep repeating these same mistakes over and over again. So maybe we need to take a different strategy. And that's kind of what I'm doing here in the presentation, if it ever loads. So my experience with disclosure. Uh, in Las Vegas at Black Hat last year, I did some personal research um, on medical devices. I am a type 1 diabetic. I have an insulin pump as well as a continuous glucose monitor kind of attached to me at all times. And I started poking around to see what kind of vulnerabilities I could find um, and what kind of things I could make it do. I just really wanted to get a basic understanding of how this thing that you know, I depend on to live um, uh, what kind of security weaknesses are there? And what I found is that I discovered that the wireless communication system in the insulin pump has some insecurities. Um, matter of fact, you could pretty much do anything you want if you had the serial number. Um, so I demonstrated this by remotely turning, writing a program and remotely turning off my own insulin pump. Um, I also could change any setting I wanted to. And this kind of has some, you can imagine, some disastrous impact. Right? I depend on this medicine and specific amounts of it um, you know, to keep me in good health. And if I start changing those settings around without knowing it, you know, it could put me in the hospital and possibly a life-threatening condition. So these are pretty significant findings. In that, I decided not to name the vendor, not to name what pump I was using, and I was not going to release any technical details, obviously, of my findings, kind of keeping things safe. Over the course of the next three weeks after that presentation, Department of Homeland Security contacted me and offered to kind of contact the vendor on my behalf, along with ICS CERT. Um, repeated attempts over a three-week period, the vendor did not answer the phone for those people, nor myself. Um, and they also released some inaccurate, inaccurate press statements, essentially saying, this isn't a problem. All you got to do is change this one setting and you don't have to worry about this anymore, which was entirely inaccurate. So given those factors, Department of Homeland Security and I decided to name the vendor, still holding back all the technical details, but putting some public pressure on the company to address these security vulnerabilities, which ultimately ended up leading to a congressional investigation of how we can better approach medical device security. And this kind of displays this new era in disclosure, right? We have a lot of new companies that aren't really new, but they're very inexperienced at dealing with security vulnerabilities, and they're struggling with this, right? They take the same actions that we saw software companies taking when software started to see so vulnerabilities, right? So, and a lot of times these embedded device companies and the engineers are totally unaware of any security implications of these devices. You know, a lot of times they built these devices in the 90s and they haven't done any code updates whatsoever to the telemetry or the wireless communication of these devices. And so there is no security wrapped in them at all. Where we have seen experienced companies embracing security researchers, right? We see companies now paying bounties on reported vulnerabilities so you can get a cash prize. And they encourage security research. So they want security researchers to go out there. They have a developed method for handling security researchers and disclosures. But with more devices comes more problems. The market demands that devices become more connected, right? Everybody wants their device to tweet, to email, to send status updates. They want Bluetooth connectivity. They want to get the data off the device. They want to have all of this access that using an embedded device brings you. We have this explosion of data, right? We have data mining, we have 
uh, smart grid activities. We have all these environmental things that we can do to make the world a better place, but now we're introducing these new variables. So now we see that everything has a CPU and that everything is connected. We also see that everything is now vulnerable. We also know that there's limited protection on this, right? With PCs and servers and the things that we've been working, the IT, has been, the IT field has been working with for decades now, we have a whole slew of products that help us. We have firewalls and IDSs and IPSs and scanners and all these tools that'll help us keep our devices secure and look at our devices and find those vulnerabilities. But now we have these new devices, which I refer to as being outside that frame. They lack a well-defined perimeter. You can't just say, well, I set this perimeter up and it's always gonna be inside that perimeter. These devices aren't stationary. They move around. If you think about medical devices like the one attached to me, I'm all over the place, right? So it could be connected to a network, it could be not connected to a network, and I'm gonna be changing places all the time. And we see this a lot with these new embedded devices. There's also a limit of there's no standards, right? In the IT field, we have well-defined communication protocols that we all agree upon for interoperability. TCP, UDP, 802.11, these are all well-defined. So we can write things, we can develop products around those standards to help us secure them. What we're finding in embedded devices is more proprietary methods, more devices, more communication methods that are not standard. It's curiosity that got me into this position, right? I wanted to know how these things work. And a lot of security researchers look at these devices in that way. They don't really go after them saying, I'm gonna break them. They wanna know how they work. They wanna be able to push the buttons and know all of the, the workings behind the scenes of these devices. That's the, that's the fun of it, right? And we even want to push the boundaries to see what these devices can do that they weren't exactly supposed to do, to kind of see what the limits of the, that technology are. So vulnerabilities are going to be found, right? Professionals are going to seek to disclose those vulnerabilities to make our world safer. So kind of the two disclosure guidelines that, that I think are really, really important here. The first one is to do no harm. If there's a vulnerability that puts, those, puts people in harm, then telling others how to replicate it and how to use it would be a problem. So let's think of, let's think of water infrastructure, for example. And let's say you poke around with the water meter at home and you figure out a way you can turn off the water to a person's home. If you came to DEF CON or some other security conference and disclosed exactly how you did that, and exactly how, and wrote a little Python script to, so you can shut off anybody's water meter without disclosing it to anybody first, or without talking to the utility company first, you could see that maybe that would cause a problem, right? You're gonna stop, you, other people might use that script and turn water off for people who legitimately need it, right? That would be problematic. But rule number two is you have to make others aware, right? Let's say you did find a vulnerability in the water infrastructure and figured out a, a, a hack to turn the water off to a house. You should disclose it. You should tell other people about it, specifically the vendor, so that way they could address that vulnerability. If you just kept it to yourself, there's a little ethical issue there because somebody else could find it and do something harmful with it. And this is a very difficult path to find, let alone follow is this balance between trying to do no harm and trying to keep things safe, but also making people aware of it so they can fix it and so you can protect it. So let's, say, let's have a little scenario here, right? Let's say a traditional vulnerability is found. Let's say in a browser, right? And the company that, that, that writes the browser is very well established. They offer a $500 bounty on vulnerabilities found. They have a, a PCERT team, which is product security incident response team, so they can, they can look at vulnerabilities and work with security researchers on these vulnerabilities, right? So you disclose your vulnerability to that company, not publicly, you go to them privately. And the company asks for a period of time to address the problem, 
and they work with you to understand that vulnerability, to see exactly what it is you found, right? The company usually will release a patch to fix the vulnerability in a month and a half or so, maybe a month, maybe less time, right? This is an easy, easy situation, right? It's an easy decision, and you're going to get very good results. You're going to address the problem, the company's going to be happy, and you're going to be happy. So the experience here is what counts, right? Experience companies have developed a process to handle vulnerabilities, right? Incident response teams um, are built to interact with outside security researchers. And they have their own researchers that can verify these reported issues and figure out exactly what the technical details are so they can accurately address them. And they even offer rewards for reporting these vulnerabilities. Just last week, we see contests like Pwn to Own, where you show up, exploit, and you know, show a pro proven exploit for a box, and you can win lots of lots of money. And that's a good way for companies to be able to get vulnerabilities and handle these vulnerabilities. And many companies are going in that direction. We also see much faster turnaround times for, these, uh, for addressing these issues publicly. You know, in some cases, like in the Pwn to Own contest we saw a couple weeks ago, we saw patches being released in less than three days from seeing a zero day to, to publicly making a patch available for it in a very short turnaround time. In this case, there's not really a need for partial disclosure or a non-disclosure option just because it's going to happen so fast, right? Companies might ask for a courtesy moratorium and say, hey, we know you'd like to go talk about this at a conference and make more people aware of it, but could you give us a couple weeks or a month or some period of time so we can research it, address the, address the issue, maybe release a patch or a workaround before you talk about it publicly? Let's take a look at another scenario, though. Let's say there's an embedded device vulnerability found. The company has no product security incident response team. They have no previous history of vulnerability handling. Disclosure to the company in this case can be risky. You know, They might take legal action against you to bury the issue, to keep you from talking about it, or to scare you into not disclosing it. But now you have an issue here. So full disclosure publicly could put maybe people at risk, right? If you come out and display all the technical details of the vulnerability, then other people can replicate it very easily, and you might be putting people in harm's way. But now you take a look at it, maybe, and just doing partial disclosure. We're talking about the problem without the technical details, and this is problematic as well because you're going to get criticism from all sides now. You're going to get people who want you to disclose the technical details, and they're going to harp on you saying, you should tell everybody so that way people can protect themselves and be fully aware of the problem. And then you're going to get people that say, you shouldn't disclose anything about it. You should never talk about it because then you're making people aware that the problem even exists. This is a very problematic scenario. This lack of experience and erratic response is very problematic for a researcher. If you have no idea what to expect, if you're going to get welcomed or punished or attacked, then it really makes it difficult to decide what direction you should go in. And you have to remember that these companies have a lot of risk on the line. They've got a PR story, they've got shareholders, they have profits, they have customers. You disclosing a vulnerability puts this company, puts whatever company, in a very difficult situation of how to address it, especially if they have no experience in it. And they get very defensive. Usually lawyers take over, especially if it's a larger company, and try and pressure you not to disclose and not to, not to talk about these things. Also, our own culture, the stigma of being a hacker, doesn't help us, right? You're looked upon as a criminal, a bad guy, you know, looking to do harm, not to try and help. And that also plays into how a company is going to look at you. So there's kind of three ways I see companies going right now. All right, company A is, is the first example, and they're the bully, right? And they might take the legal tactic of issuing a cease and desist letter, right? Claims that you're, you know, the leader will say you're claiming you're violating the copyright, and they're making false allegations, and they demand that you take, it, take whatever, you know, you've published down and issue, you know, an apology, or, you know, they might actually try and take legal action against you. 
in this case, researchers should kind of seek out some legal advice if they, re they receive something like this. The EFF is a great resource and somebody that I've worked with on disclosure of vulnerabilities before to kind of help me understand where I am legally to make the best decision possible. And they can also help in cases like this where a company might be bullying you and say, no, your legal right is here, not what the company is disclaiming. Another tactic would be for a company to hide, right? Some companies just won't return your calls or emails or anybody's call on the issue. This is very frustrating because it puts the researcher in a disclosure bind, right? You're trying to do the right thing. You're going to talk to the company about this issue before you talk publicly about it. But the company's blowing you off. So what do you do now? You found a vulnerability. You want to disclose it. You want to help the company fix this problem. But they won't give you the time of day. They also might hear you but just not communicate with you and issue public comments while never really talking to you to figure out what the vulnerability is. They might say something like, oh, just change your password and you'll be fine. When in actuality, the problem is much, much bigger than that, but they have no idea because they won't talk to you, right? Often, you know, the bad information, uh, you know, they, they give other people bad information because they didn't get the original information from the, uh, from the original researcher. The last option is just to act really slowly, right? The company responds, but they're like, yeah, we need like, a, we want you to not talk about this for a year, and we'll get back to you in a couple months on the issue, um, you know, because we don't really even know who to contact in our own company. So now what if you have a public health or welfare at risk? What's your ethical obligation there? Should you just let the vulnerability sit there out in the open for other people to find? for a year or however long the company wants to take? Or do you try and push to disclose earlier so people can take action to protect the, those you know, pieces of infrastructure or devices? This is a difficult question to answer. This also might be legitimate, right? With government regulations, with older systems, especially in SCADA environments, um, it might not be easy to find the person or people or it might be difficult to even address the issue at all. It might take them a year. So in this case, you know, patience is very important and communication is very important between the vendor and the researcher. So what can security researchers do to help? Well, first thing I like to, first thing I like to suggest is to seek out a trusted intermediary. I worked with Department of Homeland Security. There are other CERT teams out there. Uh, Idaho National Labs uh, is very good for utilities and SCADA environments, right? But we definitely need to develop more of these. SCADA has gotten a lot of coverage thanks to Stuxnet and, you know, a lot, the, the amount of um, importance on those, those uh, devices. But in other cases, like in medical devices and, and smartphones, we have almost no intermediaries that we can go to to say, hey, is there a way you can broker the information between the researcher and the vendor. The second thing that I push people to do, which can be uncomfortable, is increase professionalism, right? You're visiting on their turf. You have to play by their rules. And you have to present yourself in accordance, right? You shouldn't show up wearing your best DEF CON 3 t-shirt, you know, that you've had for the last 10 years and a pair of camel pants when you present to a company like this, right? You have to try and address, you know, the situation so that way you can take it as seriously as you can. You know, you have to listen to the company's concerns and be flexible. Just because you found a vulnerability and you think it's ultra important, you might not understand all of the concerns that the company might have. It's not just as simple as fix these three lines of code and you're all set. There's a lot more usually to it from the company's perspective than from the researcher's perspective. So you have to be flexible and you have to keep those things in mind when you're talking to a company. You also really have to stress being on the good side, right? You have to show up with ideas on how to address, address the issue, not just say, hey, I found this thing, it's broken, you need to fix it. They might not know how to fix it. So you need to be able to come to the table and say, hey, 
you know, I found these things, and I think there are a couple different ways that you can fix that very easily. And if you want my input on that, I'd be happy to give it to you. You also have to be complimentary. If you walk in there and say, hey, your product sucks. I found a vulnerability. How, dare, how did you dare? Did you do any testing at all? You've got to be kidding me, right? If you call their baby ugly, they will react poorly to you. They will not take you seriously. So you have to find ways to complement the product while still showing that it is vulnerable, right? You have to kind of take that into consideration. Otherwise, they're going to be upset. Now, what can companies do to help this situation? First is they have to have a plan, right? You know, I think a lot of these companies just say, oh my god, I never really thought that we would actually have a vulnerability in our product. I have no idea what to do. So you have to kind of do some scenario role playing, right? And companies have done a really good job of this in, in business continuity plans, right? What do we do in the event of an earthquake? What do we do in the event of a fire? What do we do in the event of a national, or a, you know, a national disaster? And they say, oh, well, we have this calling tree, and we take our backups here, and we do this, and this is the person that's in charge, and this is who you contact for PR. Companies need to start doing this for vulnerabilities as well. They have to say, not if we're going to have a vulnerability, but when, and how are we going to address it, right? And you have to be sure to have options, right? Plan like you will have a vulnerability to address. You know, I see companies that say, well, we have no way of updating that device without a full recall and actually physically changing the chip. Well, that is sh fairly short-sighted. You have no options at that point if there are a vulnerability discovered, right? You might go bankrupt in even trying to fix that vulnerability. So when you develop your products, you have to keep that in mind. You have to have options if a vulnerability were ever to be discovered. Also, companies should avoid trying to reinvent the wheel, right? Use standard, well-developed methods, right? I see some companies that are like, you know what? Instead of using AES encryption, we, uh, we, we found a developer and we gave him a weekend and we said, hey, can you write some sort of new encryption that's proprietary so that nobody will know about it? I'm pretty sure that somebody with no experience in encryption, or even if they do have experience in encryption, are not going to write something as good as AES in a weekend. Right? So use those things that are well tested and peer reviewed and have been used in the industry for a long time. Don't try and hide behind obscurity. Don't try and you know, develop your own thing just to say, well, we have a secret and it's our proprietary you know, kind of sauce. Companies can also create an incident response team or at least an incident response policy, right? And what this is going to do is it's going to let researchers know what to expect. It's going to give them a point of contact. It's going to also show that you kind of have an inkling of uh, how to deal with a vulnerability when they're, when they're discovered and disclosed. So you can take that information and say, yeah, you know, we got, you know, you can contact somebody and you're going to get a response within 48 hours. Well, that helps the researcher know, hey, I can probably disclose this vulnerability before going public with it because the company probably has a plan. They've thought this out. Also, companies need to be professional as well, right? If, if you disclose a vulnerability and the company's like, you're just a hacker, nobody's ever going to do that, nobody else is going to find that, you just found this one little thing, I don't think anybody else is ever going to want to do that. You know, your work really isn't that important, right? Don't call our baby ugly, because we won't take it that well either. Right? Companies should try and listen, just like we have to try and listen. You don't have to necessarily take that advice that we give, but you should at least be receptive to it. And you should recognize that professional security researchers are your friend. You know? Most of us want to try and make things better, that we want to make sure that these vulnerabilities are patched and that the world becomes a safer place. We're not out to put your company out of business or you know, to try and do damage to your company. Sometimes, though, the world isn't perfect, and you can't get what you want. Some things cannot be fixed. 
if you find a vulnerability like this, and I think that we're going to start seeing this, especially with older systems, that they just can't be addressed. They can't be fixed. It might cost too much, right? The age of the system might prevent it from being patched or fixed or worked around. The remote aspect of it, maybe, you know, if you found something that's broken that's used on, you know, oil pipelines that have thousands and thousands of miles of pipeline, it just might not be feasible to fix all of the sensors or all the SCADA equipment along that entire pipeline. You know, you've got to try and come up with alternate plans, either working around the issue or containing the problem or putting as the best containment around the problem as possible. I do envision scenarios, though, where you're just going to have to bury it. Right? This is a horrible option, but in some cases it might be needed, where you might not be able to publicly disclose this ever, and it might never be fixed. You know, but the importance here is to communicate with, with the vendor about that, to have a communication to say, hey, you really you can't fix this? And they might give you a list of reasons why they can't fix it. And you might go, yeah, OK, I can kind of understand that. You know. So you have to be kind of open to these ideas, and you might not have a perfect solution. One thing that really kind of caught me by surprise um, that I was totally unprepared for was the end users, right? And these are kind of new players at the table with embedded devices, right? And they, in the previously, in the IT world, they pretty much have no impact on this at all, right? If there's an email disclosure or email vulnerability or web server vulnerability, right? Big deal. Yeah, there are some risks to the individual users, right? They get their credit card stolen. They get their identity stolen. In reality, though, those are pretty limited in their impact. With these new class of devices, though, we have a much higher impact. People have a higher degree of dependency on them. In some cases, like in medical devices, they're needed to live or maybe to maintain civilized life. If you think about water, if you think about power, if you think about sewage, if you think about cell phone towers and communication paths. So in my insulin pump talk, I immediately got significant user backlash, right? Now, insulin pump users are very vocal. They literally are tied to their devices to keep them alive and healthy. For example, my insulin pump right here is connected to me by this tube. It is attached to me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If I wanted to, I could take a shower with this. I do everything with this attached to me. I need it to deliver medication to stay healthy. So I'm pretty vocal about when people find things wrong or people have issues with insulin pumps. Right? We also have to keep in mind that children use these, sometimes as young as three years old, to keep themselves alive. And that is going to make people more anxious and more vocal about it. Also, they're online, and they're very vocal. They refer to themselves as the DOC, the Diabetic Online Community, right? And it's really a very good support group for them. They can share experiences. They can learn about what works with these devices, what doesn't work with these devices, and kind of have a feeling that they're not alone. So the first complaint I started to get was, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you trying to break insulin pumps? And the implication there is that I was evil and that I'm looking to cause harm, that I'm going to go after diabetics and turn their insulin pumps off and try and harm them, and that by even talking about this idea in vague terms uh, is going to spur other people to do it. You know, I'm going to teach my hacker brethren how to break into insulin pumps so they can harm more people. All right, so my answer to this is we do it in order to learn. Right? We look at these security issues. We look at these devices and how they work in order to learn what they can do. Right? And we need to get to them before bad guys get to them. Right? Those vulnerabilities are there. They are going to be found. Hopefully, they are found by people that are professionals. They're going to talk to the company and try and address the issue and not try and exploit them for gain or for harm. The second complaint I got was that this is totally overblown. Who would bother to attack a diabetic, right? There's very limited range to, your, to, to, the, to these issues. It's totally overblown. 
I was even called that this idea is just stupid. Well, the answer to this, and the answer that I try and give, is about how you think about security. And when I talk to people, I tell them, security is an all the time thing, not a sometimes thing, right? So I say, I always tell people, I ask people, do you live in a safe neighborhood? And they say, yeah, I live in a great neighborhood. I say, okay, when you go to bed at night, do you lock the front door? Yeah, I lock the front door every night. Well, do you think you're gonna get robbed? No. That type of security mentality, you're securing yourself all the time. Even if you believe there is absolutely no risk, you need to be secure. That's how security works, is by being vigilant and being aware at all times. Even if you think the risk is minimal or non-existent, you still take those precautions. And that's the same way we need to address these vulnerabilities. Also got emails from freaked out parents. Oh my God. Should I take my child off my ins that, their insulin pump and go back to giving them eight to 10 manual shots a day? On face, this is a pretty good question, right? If you don't know any better, if you're not part of the InfoSec community, you're gonna freak out. It would be the same thing if we said, oh my God, I found a vulnerability in Firefox, I'm never gonna browse the web again. It's just not realistic, right? That is the best medical care that you can provide your child. Why would you take it off it because of a limited risk? One thing also I didn't consider is the far-reaching impacts of disclosing something like this. So theoretically, what if a person of power above you, the president of the company you work for, has relatives that have that medical device, and they think what you did was wrong? They believe that you are a bad guy, that you're a hacker. How do you think that might impact your career if somebody above you thinks that the work you did was unethical? These are some of the considerations you have to take when you're going to disclose you know, a vulnerability that has this kind of potential. I did get a lot of good things out of this, though. I did get a lot of good emails, emails from medical re the medical research community that gave me more ideas and encouragement to keep going with this type of research. From hospital directors admiring the fact that I put pressure on the vendor to fix the issue and to address the issue. A lot of times these hospital directors don't have the ability to do that because they're dependent upon funding from these companies, right? So as an independent body, as an independent person, I can put pressure on the company and force them or put pressure on them to address these issues when others can't. I also got other users that asked me when I would start working on their brand of insulin pump to see what vulnerabilities I could find in their devices, in other devices. So what are the takeaways here? The first thing that you could take away is that I failed to address the end user completely, right? I had not considered any explanation directed toward the end users. I found a way to turn off an insulin pump remotely. And I didn't say, but don't worry, if you use this, it is still very safe and it's a very limited issue to deal with. The important thing is to stay on your insulin pump and to get the best care possible. That is what I should have said, right? I have, you have to realize that in these situations that you're not always gonna be dealing with InfoSec people, that people that understand the culture, and you have to use a different rhetoric. You have to address that and say, well, I know what I found is significant, but the reality for the end user is that it's not significant, right? You also have to realize that some of these things that we're gonna find in these embedded devices are gonna have major life impact. This isn't like getting your credit card stolen and you call the bank and like, hey, they stole my credit card and the bank refunds your money and they give you a new credit card. This can be much bigger than that. These embedded devices are used in multitudes of ways that can have a major impact on not only a person's life, but maybe large communities. You need to take a step back and look at who uses these products and how it affects their lives. So in closing here, the, the real point is that disclosure is hard. Right? The issues that we face with disclosure are very difficult, and the issues that companies face with, with disclosure is very difficult. 
there's never going to be a right path, a well-defined path that is going to address everybody's concerns. There are always going to be others that thought you should have taken the other path that said, hey, you should have released all the technical details so that way me, I can protect my house, I can protect my device by knowing exactly what that vulnerability is. And there are others that are going to say, you should never talk about that vulnerability because it puts so many other people at risk. There is no right answer. But there are some wrong answers, right? If you find something that can totally turn off the electrical grid, you shouldn't write it into a script and publish it, right? There are some things that are pretty clear cut, but finding the right answer is very difficult. The other thing that I think is really important and really meaningful is community feedback. When people come up to me and talk to me and say, wow, that was really cool. You know, I'm really inspired by your work. I think you did, such, you, you did a great job. It really means the world to a researcher. You know, it makes all of those hours, it makes all of the, that research and all that extra time worth it. And it gives us motivation to continue to look for these types of vulnerabilities. Also, bad feedback, meaning that like, hey, I think that you could have done this better. I think you could have done this differently. That's also exceptionally helpful, right? The community needs to help ourselves in giving good feedback so that way we can become better. Thank you very much you know, for attending the talk. You can find me at my email address or my Twitter handle. Um, please remember to fill out the feedback forms that, that Black Hat you know, provides for you so that way speakers can get feedback and the conference can get feedback on how you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.